Jasper Wood Products Company, the maker of Jasper drum shells, opened its doors in 1924 and took its name from the town of Jasper in Du Bois County, Indiana, where it was founded in part by four members of the prominent Grommelsbacher family. The settlement of this family started with Joseph Grommelsbacher, who immigrated to Jasper from Germany in 1837 at the age of 25. He married Sophia Friedman. Together, they raised eight children, and the family ventured into the woodworking industry and became associated with numerous enterprises. Among the earliest were the Jasper Desk Company, Jasper Veneer Mills, both which were established in the late 1800s. In 1849, they built the first two-story brick home in Jasper, and it's known today as the Grommelspacher Guts Wheeler House and is on the National Register of Historic Places. So now let's get back to the four grandchildren who went on to establish the Jasper Wood Company. Clarence U. Grommelspacher, born 1896. He was the general manager of Jasper Wood Products and was an established inventor who held several patents, including one for the tubeless tire, which eventually sold the Firestone, one for the earliest food mixer, and a patent for plywood that was used in airplanes in World War II. We will take a closer look at some of his other patents shortly. Claude A. Grommelspacher, born 1894. He not only co-founded the Jasper Wood Products Company, but also held various positions in several other companies, such as Grommelspacher Farms, Jasper Office Furniture, Eckstein Lumber Company, Jasper Novelty Furniture Company, and Jasper Veneer Mills, a company that was crucial in the Gretsch shell formula, as we will get into shortly. Virgil Grommelspacher, the eldest sibling. He was born in 1891 and was the president of Jasper Wood Products Company, but also held positions in the Jasper Glove Company and Jasper Veneer Mills. Lastly, we have Elsie Grommelspacher. All I know about her is that she was one of the founders and original shareholders. She later married and changed her last name to Christian. The main office and factory of the company was located at 1316 Vine Street and the adjacent property at 500 East 13th Street, Jasper, Indiana. In 2018, both of these properties were converted into 62 residential lofts called Vine Street Lofts. The company also added an additional facility much later in 1990 at 2424 Kathy Lane. Not surprisingly, the company was focused on making molded plywood parts and pioneered making curved plywood using a dielectric process to cure the glue lines. I'm not sure exactly what this entails, but it was described to me as a microwave technology that uses radio frequencies. The plies are coated with glue and placed in a curved or circular mold lined with electrodes that uses this technology to heat and dry the plies. It was also reported that Jasper used some sort of red metal particles or flakes in the glue and that these particles were used to identify a Jasper component or product. In reviewing their patents, and two in particular drew my attention. The first is from 1939, entitled Veneer Molding Process, and reads, this invention relates to a process for forming individual sheets of wood veneer or a very flexible plywood, say two or three ply, into articles of desired configuration and more particularly to a process for forming said sheets into articles embodying simple or compound curves. The patent goes on to describe how these curves in the plywood are made using a mold and pressure from an inflatable device. The second patent is from 1942 and is even more interesting because it not only starts to introduce a shape that's much closer to a drum shell, but also introduces the concept of horizontal and vertical grain structure to increase strength and to reduce the visibility of a seam. This is a patent for a plywood barrel. A section of the patent reads, Another object of the invention is to provide a method of manufacturing plywood barrels wherein the plies are so arranged with respect to one another that there is no definite seam through the barrel. And you can see here in figure two, the horizontal and vertical arrangement. With respect to this, the patent reads, figure two is a perspective elevational view of the plies for forming a sheet of plywood, having the grain positioned 90 degrees with respect to one another. In addition to making drum shells, they made furniture, airplane components, such as propellers, navigation tables for the war, parts for guitars, cellos, banjo rims, and they made parts for Howard Hughes' spruce goose, which due to wartime restrictions on metals, was made almost exclusively of wood, except for the engines, electronics, screws, and a few other parts, and was the largest plane ever constructed at the time. Later, they went on to making cabinets for the Yamaha Piano and Organ Company, Zenith Televisions, and they even made panels for the iconic Woody Station Wagon. Their earliest large-scale entry into manufacturing and supplying drum shells was in the mid-50s, when Roger started to purchase three-ply shells with a re-ring from Jasper shortly after they built and moved their factory to Covington, Ohio. 
If you're lucky enough to own a Rogers kit from the Jasper era, you know how great they sound. But Rogers never did advertise the wood species or the source of these shells, except for the reinforcement ring, which was said to be maple. They instead chose to advertise their strength and branded them permabilt shells. Rogers attributed the strength of their shells to the dielectric process, claiming that since the timber itself is not subject to steaming or excessive heating, it retains its natural resilience with no tendency to warp. And to the stagger seam construction of the shell. I described this in my last video on the Keller episode, but to recap, this is where the butt joints or the seams are staggered around the shell so that no two joints are next to one another. Rogers continues to explain that this type of engineering results in superior strength since the outer lamination is no more highly stressed than the inner and the structure is intrinsically stable. And in case you doubted their claims, they put out this promotional piece in their 1956 catalog showing five employees weighing 824 pounds collectively standing on a parade drum shell made by Jasper. And although no mention was ever made of the type of wood used in the plies, we now know for certain from the good forensic work done by Anthony Amadeo, Rick Giles, and Jeff Burke, what the wood species were in these early shells. I asked Anthony to comment on his findings, and he sent me this clip that describes the mind-blowing lengths he went into to settle this question once and for all. Through our research and wood ply analysis conducted by Harry Alden of Alden Identification and Microscopic Wood ID Services, a wood science specialist and DNA expert out of Maryland with over 30 years experience in identifying wood species, we have found nothing but maple acer species plies and Rogers Jasper shells dating from the 1950s into the mid-1960s. These three-ply shells with three-ply maple re-rings as per request of Henry Grossman and Ben Strauss were built specifically to Rogers specs, as were the Keller shells that followed, with staggered butt joint plies. And there you have it. Jasper's business found a new big customer for their shelves in the late 50s when Gretsch decided to switch from their three-ply shell that they made in-house to a six-ply shell made for them by Jasper. By that time, there was already a relationship between the two companies as Jasper was supplying Gretsch parts for their guitars. The wood formula that Gretsch used in their in-house shell was a combination of maple and poplar. However, the Jasper six-ply shell was a combination of maple and gumwood. And this would be the magic formula that became known as that great Gretsch sound. And it's still the formula used by Gretsch today. For reference, the hardness of a wood is measured using a scale called the Janka rating. The lower the number, the softer the wood, and in general, the softer the wood, the lower the amplitude and resident frequency. How this translates when the wood is manipulated into plies, then sandwiched between other plies of different woods, is obviously a factor in the sound. But here are the ratings for these three wood species. Poplar has a Janka rating of 540 and is the softest of the three. Gumwood, on the other hand, has a rating of 850, and hard maple is on the higher end at 1,450. To know where these sit comparatively, here's a list and approximate Janka ratings for some of the popular wood species used in drum shells. I can't be certain who made the decision to use gumwood, and at that time, drum makers were not big into advertising what wood species or wood types were being used like they are today. But I do know that the use of gumwood brought down the cost of the shells and was a locally sourced wood purchased from Jasper Veneer Mills, a Grammelspacher family business. The sweet gum tree, or as it's called, sweet gum liquid amber styracaflua, Sweet gum, liquid amber, styracaflua are abundant in that area. And because they are softer and more porous than maple, are easier to mold and adhere better to glue. On the other hand, the maple veneers that Jasper was using at the time were made with wood purchased from Wisconsin, Michigan, and Southern Ontario. Jasper will go on to supply shells from many more drum makers until they close their doors in 2003. In addition to Rogers and Gretsch, they made shells at some point in time for Camco, Fibes, the Austin Vintage, George Way, Ludwig, and Quarter Drums. Johnny Craviato's first custom snares were Jasper shells purchased from Quarter. I'm sure this list is far from complete, so if you can think of any other names, big or small, please drop it in the comments. Here is a newspaper clip from the Du Bois County Herald from August 26, 2002, announcing the closure. From the article, we learned that Jasper employed 200 people in their last year of operations. According to the chairman, Mark Rommelsbacher, the decline in the furniture industry and the competition from the Asian markets was cited as the reason. However, I was told there's much more to the story. In 2001 and 2002, 
Jasper ventured deeper into the finished goods market and, in essence, competed with some of their own customers who were purchasing parts from Jasper for their own finished goods. They also changed their pricing model on smaller orders. They would eventually lose their two largest customers, Paoli Furniture, now out of business themselves, and Styline Furniture, now OFS. Together, these two made up close to 80% of Jasper's business. The drum shelf side of things was always consistent, but represented only about 5% of the company's total sales volume. So it really was the loss of the furniture business that unfortunately brought the entire company to its end. Before they shut down, Gretsch purchased all the remaining inventory from Jasper and passed on the same exact formula to their new supplier, Keller Wood Products. The shelves that Gretsch had been purchasing from Jasper were often uncut tubes, and they would cut them down at the Gretsch facility. This apparently was not the case with their other customers, and there's no way to know how many feet Gretsch purchased at the end or how long after 2003 that inventory lasted. But it's safe to say that there are Gretsch kits out there dated well after 2003 that have Jasper shelves. I'd like to give a special thank you to the following people who have provided information for this episode. Rick Giles, Anthony Amadeo, Phil Gramelspacher, Nancy at the Jasper Chamber of Commerce, and Gary Schnell from Sell for Free Real Estate, who wanted me to let you all know that Jasper, Indiana is open for business and a great place to live. So if you're looking to relocate, he's your guy. If there are any drum-related topics you wish for me to cover in the future, please let me know in the comments. I'd love to hear from you and get your suggestions. But for now, that's it for this one. Thank you so much for watching.